Today is Monday, October 17th, 2022. I'm going to again focus on the situation in and around Ukraine. And it's not because there's nothing else important going on around the world. It's because of how crucial this conflict is to outcomes all around the world. As I like to do, let's go to the map. This is liveuamap.com. It is very pro Ukraine. So just keep that in mind when we take a look at it. But even this pro Ukraine map is admitting uh, the continued missile and drone campaign launched by Russia against Ukrainian positions all across the country from uh, west to east, from north to south. They are reporting blackouts. Uh, earlier, Kharkov had suspended the metro because of blackouts. Uh, so this is a continuation for now over a week. Let's look at the front lines where Ukraine launched its its offensives around Kherson. The lines are stabilized for the time being. My last update, I talked about a push from this direction by Ukrainian forces. I said I would update my audience on how that turned out. Russia repelled it and Ukraine suffered uh, large losses in, in manpower and equipment. And this has been the pattern throughout the entire offensive. Ukraine is hemorrhaging men and equipment that, that cannot practically be replaced. Many speculate that this could have been a diversionary attack, uh, a feint. Uh, but a, a lot of time has now gone by since that attack, and there has been no follow-up attack. So any, any attack that happens at this point, Russia will have had plenty of time to prepare for it and then get ahead of it. So maybe it wasn't that. Others have said it was reconnaissance in force. The purpose of reconnaissance in force is to attack the enemy, not to overwhelm them or to take their positions, but to uh, force them to fire back and ascertain information about the disposition of enemy forces. How many, what kind of equipment do they have? How much ammunition does it seem like they have? Are they, are they trying to conserve ammunition? Are they throwing everything they have at us? You get that information and then you try to take as many men and as much equipment as possible back intact. And that is not what happened. So if it was reconnaissance in force, it, it was a botched operation, heavy losses, not good. If it was just an attempted offensive, then it failed. It was repelled. So this is what's going on around Kherson. It's not to say that Ukraine isn't going to try again. It's not to say that they're not going to have... Uh, more success in subsequent attacks, but it is to say that that attack failed. If we go back to the map, uh, this line along here in the Zaporozhia region, there, there has been reported concentrations of Ukrainian forces. This is why everyone assumes there's going to be some sort of offensive, but so far there has not been, but keep an eye on this area, Mileripol and Mariupol could be potential targets. We can see that there is fighting from Donetsk city. Now we're in the Donbas region, all the way up to Seversk, Bakhmut, Solidar, and Seversk. This is a major Ukrainian defense line. Russia is attempting to punch a hole through this line at Bakhmut. This is a major breakthrough for Russian forces. And this is a development that even the Western media is now talking about. I had, I had been hearing for weeks now that Russian forces were making a lot of progress around Bakhmut, even as they gave up Kharkov and a little bit of territory around Kherson, they continued to advance around Bakhmut. Now, even the Western media is reporting on this. We have articles like this from France 24, under approaching Russian fire in Bakhmut, Eastern Ukraine. And the article says, days are spent under a hail of shells and nights bring no respite for Ukrainian soldiers as enemy forces draw ever closer in Bakhmut, one of the last towns where Russian troops are still advancing. It also says the metallic boom of shelling echoes across the hills surrounding the small town, home to 70,000 people before the war. Russia has been falling back in its offensive, but in Bakhmut, unlike across most of the front line, Ukrainians are on the defensive. They face the most difficult challenges President Vladimir Zelensky said this weekend, Ukrainian troops still control the northern and western parts of the city, AFP journalists saw on Saturday. On Thursday, they said uh, they, referring to Russian forces, recaptured two neighboring villages. The retaking of the two villages raised fears that Russian forces, including Wagner paramilitary units, 
may have infiltrated the eastern part of the city, according to a British intelligence note. On the ground, Ukrainian soldiers told AFP there was now close combat with members of pro-Russian forces. And then as, as you go through the rest of the article, there's a section titled Lost Purpose, and they're referring to Ukraine's prospects of holding this town uh, for any length of time. It really appears that Russia is going to take it. This is not quite true, though, is it, that Russia is falling back everywhere else. We just looked at the map. They're not falling back around Kherson. They're not even falling back around Kharkov anymore. Uh, Ukrainian forces are you know, right along the edge of Lugansk, and that's where they've been for weeks now. So Russian forces aren't falling back anymore. They're, they're attacking. They haven't, take, they haven't taken any uh, large, significant amounts of territory, but they're, they're on the attack now. Uh, Ukraine may or may not have the ability to launch further offensives, but it's quite clear that that momentum, that spectacular momentum that they had, they have lost that. There are, uh, there are other reports from the Western media on this. This is ABC. This is based in Australia. Heavy fighting in Solodar, Bakhmut, in Donbas. They're also talking about Russia sends thousands of troops to Belarus. The article says, intense fighting between Russian and Ukrainian forces has taken place around two towns in the Donetsk region. Uh, Av Ide insists on calling it Eastern Ukraine. It is now officially considered part of Russia, at least from Russia's point of view. Bakhmut and Solidar, the key hotspots in Donbas are Solidar and Bakhmut, Ukraine's president uh, Zelensky said in his nightly video address. The article also says the town of Bakhmut has been the next target of Russia's armed forces in their slow advance through the Donetsk region since taking the key industrial towns Blizychansk and Severodonetsk in June and July. Solidar lies just to the north of Bakhmut. And Bakhmut Solidar, Severs, they're significant because they are the last massive major Ukrainian defense line before uh, Slavyansk and Kramatorsk. And then after that, Russia has taken all territory in Donetsk. And that is the significance of, of this. I have repeatedly said that Ukraine's offensives were not a turning point in this conflict. They were a desperate last ditch attempt to, to cause something, uh, some sort of political solution ahead of what will be a military resolution for this conflict in Russia's favor. They are throwing everything they have at Kherson, uh, charging across Kharkov and trying to push into northern Donbas uh, to hold places like Bakhmut. And they're losing huge amounts of men and equipment. And, and Russia is not losing huge amounts of men and equipment. They're, they're losing men, they're losing equipment, but not on the massive scale that Ukraine is. Uh, when Russia is on the offensive, they are slow, methodical. The Western media always points out how slow they're going, but they are preserving their manpower and equipment in the process while taking a heavy toll out on Ukrainian forces. And when Ukraine is on the offensive, it is also at the expense of Ukrainian men and equipment, uh, just much larger numbers of losses for both. At the fullest extent of Ukraine's ability to push this offensive, however further it goes, even if, let's say, Ukraine did manage to take Kherson City, in, in the south. No matter how far they get with this offensive, they are going to burn out. They are going to be out of equipment, out of ammunition, and then they're going to be facing Russian forces that have conserved their fighting capacity and who are also being reinforced by 300,000 additional troops and associated equipment. This type of reinforcement is not coming for Ukraine unless NATO intervenes directly. That reinforcement is not coming for Ukraine. That is what they're going to face after they fully extend themselves with these offensives. As a matter of fact, if they were to somehow take Kherson City, it would, it would be spectacular headlines at first, but then the realization of just how overstretched, overextended Ukrainian forces had become and how disastrous it will be when Russia finally makes its move. It is very clear Russia is preparing for a very big move 
here soon. When? I don't know. I don't sit in on Russian general staff meetings, but it's very obvious they're preparing something very large. Now, I have talked about Ukraine depleting its manpower and equipment and about how the West is unable to replace it. They're unable to replace it, and the Western media admits this, that the West is out of equipment, vehicles, and ammunition to send Ukraine. I mean, they still have things that they can send, but just not anywhere near the quantities and quality that Ukraine requires. However, you will see the Western media, while admitting this, this fact that they're running out of aid to send Ukraine, they will make it out as if that doesn't really matter anyway. And then you get articles like this. I just wanna, I wanna point out the, the propaganda here. This is from Business Insider. I saw this just today. Russia is making excuses for why it can't stop US made HIMARS from shredding its military in Ukraine. So it makes it sound like Russia is making excuses. It makes it sound like the Russian Ministry of Defense came out with some sort of statement and Business Insider is going to to, to break this down. Only in reality, it, it's not Russia making excuses, it's some random account on social media that uh, made, made this claim or made these excuses. It says, why can't Russia destroy Ukraine's US-made HIMARS rocket launchers? One, one, only one Russian defense blog has an explanation. HIMARS has a secret feature that prevents Russian artillery from targeting it. Not quite. Western defense experts say uh, the more likely reason is Russian incompetence. Now, Russia, as in the Russian Ministry of Defense, has actually regularly reported that they are in fact destroying HIMARS, the launchers, and also large numbers of the rockets uh, when they find where they're being stored, they launch a missile at it and they destroy it. And this might be a contributing factor to HIMARS running low on ammunition. I'll get into that in just a moment. But they've been they've been reporting on destroying HIMARS launchers all along. As, as a matter of fact, I stopped counting, but m the last time I kept track of how many, it was over half of the 16 that the US sent. Now they have sent another four. I'll get into that in just a moment. I continue to hear people say, you know, what a massive difference HIMARS has made for Ukraine. We, we were just looking at the map. What difference is it making? If it was shredding the Russian military, Ukraine would have been in Kherson weeks ago. Uh, they're not. They're not they're not getting to Kherson city. Not not yet. And in the process they are hemorrhaging all of the men and equipment in their military doing so, attempting to do so. In Kharkov, the Kharkov offensive, if HIMARS was shredding Russia's military, they would not have ground to a halt the moment they ran into Russian forces that were determined to stand and fight. Uh, when they push into Kharkov, Russian forces were not properly defending it. They did not have anywhere near the numbers they would need to properly defend it. It was practically undefended. This is according to Russian and Western analysts. Ukraine was able to sweep across the area and take all of that territory. Uh, their first actual real battle was Lehman, and they, they were fi the, the fighting was protracted. Ukraine suffered heavy losses. They managed to take Lehman, and that's where they've been ever since. They have not been able to push further since then. That does not sound like a, an army that is shredding Russian forces. That does not sound like an army that is greatly benefiting from HIMARS. HIMARS is delaying the inevitable. It's delaying the inevitable military loss of Ukrainian forces. That's all it's doing. It's giving Ukraine a capability they had had at the beginning of this, this uh, in late February. They had large numbers of their own multiple launch rocket systems. They were running low on them because they were getting destroyed by Russian forces. So the US and its allies began sending multiple launch rocket systems, including HIMARS, and they are also being destroyed. Now, there's a couple of clues from the Western media itself that debunk this notion that Russia is unable to destroy HIMARS, uh, other than, you know, Russia publishing videos, at least two videos that clearly showed HIMARS being destroyed. There's this article from the New York Times. A new package of U.S. military aid will speed more mobile rocket launchers to Ukraine. And this was uh, the beginning of this month, October 4th, 2022. 
I had gone over how many in the Western media during these Pentagon briefings would ask the senior military representative, uh, you know, why are, if HIMARS is doing so great, like you're telling us, why aren't we sending more? Why did we only send 16? And they said 16 is about the, the right number for Ukraine in terms of how, how many we can send to them, how many Ukrainians we can train to operate them, and also the amount of ammunition we have to supply to them under these intense uh, type of combat conditions. So if that that's the case, and if the United States is running out of ammunition, including ammunition from HIMARS, so here's another article from, from France 24, US ammunition supplies dwindle as Ukraine war drains stockpiles. Uh, it says, the United States will soon be unable to provide Ukraine with certain types of ammunition that are essential to Kiev's battle against Russia's invasion as supplies are being used up faster than they can be replaced. That sounds like a really big problem. And they mention HIMARS specifically, and they talk about how U.S. stocks of ammunition for HIMARS, which fires GPS-guided rockets known as Gimlers, with a range of more than 80 kilometers, are dwindling. The United States sent one-third of that inventory to Ukraine, as has been the case with Javelin and Stinger missiles, Ukraine would receive 8,000 to 10,000 rockets. That inventory would likely last several months. It's been several months. Uh, but when the inventory is exhausted, there are no alternatives. There are no alternatives. Production is about 5,000 a year. So that would not cover the amount that Ukraine uh, is assumed to have been using all of this time. Uh, not even close. So if you have sent Ukraine 16 HIMARS, that is as many as you can send that is practical in terms of how many Ukrainians you've trained and how many rockets you can send to them to use, why would you send four more unless at least some of them have been disabled or destroyed? It's common sense. It's common sense. Yes, they have lost HIMARS. Russia is not having a hard time destroying HIMARS. They're not having a hard time destroying anything, which is why the West is out of ammunition, out of weapons, out of equipment, why Ukraine is running out of tanks, running out of aircraft. That is the reason why, because Russia is destroying it. They're not having a hard time destroying it. They are systematically, methodically eliminating everything in Ukraine's military. So the, the U.S. proxy war, and that's what it is. The U.S. proxy war using Ukraine against Russia, it's not going very well. I mean, you're out of weapons to send your proxies. Uh, and the nation that you're trying to fight by proxy is putting what essentially is a whole army on the field as reinforcements, 300,000 uh, plus associated equipment. Uh, desperation is going to set in and it is setting in and this desperation manifests itself in all kinds of ways uh, I am uh, very regularly following the Duran uh, Alex Christoforou and Alexander Mikuris I highly recommend uh, tuning in to their program they both have their own YouTube channels and they are constantly talking about the sort of dangerous desperation that is setting in politically across the West. They, they go into great detail about the, the political climate in the West. And we are hearing about the West uh, projecting onto Russia this, this paranoia that Russia is going to use nuclear weapons. Now, it's, it's very clearly the West introducing this idea and really working this into the minds of the, the collective public. You also saw Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky talking about G7 sending troops to monitor the border between Ukraine and Belarus. You, you can see signs of desperation setting in and desperate ideas coming forth because the way they were trying to fight this proxy war is not working. And I myself have warned about the United States and its allies attempting to create some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine, just like the US did in Eastern Syria. I think they feel like they, they have set the precedent already. They have previously and successfully deconflicted with Russia in Syria. They maybe think they can do it again in Ukraine, at least salvage something out of this entire mess. Uh, but it's, it's not guaranteed. Well, another example of this desperation manifesting itself is this op-ed in Politico 
It's an opinion piece. It's titled, India's stance on the Ukraine war makes little sense. And it's by someone called Janus Lazda. And Politico says, Janus Lazda was a policy advisor in the White House and U.S. Senate. So it's not nobody. Doesn't it, India's stance on the Ukraine war makes little sense. So there's a couple of possibilities as to why it doesn't make any sense. Maybe it doesn't make any sense because India has an irrational foreign policy. No, they don't. Their policy is very rational. So it's not that. Maybe Lazda and the rest of the U.S. government are just incapable of understanding the rational reasons India is not subordinating itself to U.S. foreign policy objectives. Maybe that's it. Or the U.S. fully understands uh, why India is not doing so, why they are pursuing a foreign policy that serves India's best interests, not Washington's, and they just want uh, the, the gullible public to believe otherwise, to believe that it's irrational and somehow India is bad and the West is good and shame on India. And they're trying to heap political pressure on India to reverse course, which I, I don't think is going to work. Let's read some of this op-ed. This is, this is unbelievable that we're in the year 2022 and this condescending, arrogant Westerner lecturing India about things like colonization and imperialism and freedom. I think India is much more acquainted with the evil of imperialism than anyone sitting in the US. They're not on the receiving end of it. They have always been on the delivering end of it. Let's read some of this. Ukraine's successful counteroffensive against Russian forces continues, continues to surprise and impress. It surprises for the military ab military's ability to emerge from six years of grinding war as a force that's agile, strategic, and lethal, or out of out of weapons, out of tanks, out of aircraft, begging begging for more and depleted, overextended. We were looking at the map together. We, we can see that that is not the case. So we could already tell that this uh, Lazda character is going to just hit on every propaganda talking point possible to stick it to India. That, that is already quite obvious. It continues. And it has impressed with how it's been able to counter Russian President Vladimir Putin's propaganda machine, Russia's brutal attacks on civilians, and has rallied the United States and Western allies to arm, train, and plan. Most notably, all of this has been achieved in service of principles nearly forgotten in our divisive era. Unity and patriotism over division and cynicism, democracy over despotism, national self-determination over imperialism. I, ju I just did a video on how Ukraine has multiple kill lists and people are on these lists to intimidate them. These are people on their list for political views, not not because they did any sort of crime or anything, for their political views or for their journalism, maybe journalism that is done in a way that is unflattering to Ukraine, no matter how uh, accurate the reporting is. These are kill lists, some of them were created as far back as 2014. And 2014 was when the United States overthrew the elected government of Ukraine and installed a client regime into power that answered to Washington, not to the Ukrainian people. And it is self-evident that everything from 2014 onward has been on behalf of Washington at the expense of the Ukrainian people, at the expense of their economy, uh, the stability, unity, harmony, all of these things. Lazda pretends that Ukraine is leveraging now. These are all things that have been utterly destroyed over the last eight years. Uh, so Ukraine is, is, hardly, is hardly a democracy over despotism. It's hardly national self-determination over imperialism. It is a product of modern day imperialism. And then on, on to India. This is what this op-ed says. Lazda says, India itself was a colony just 75 years ago, yet it's now standing on the side of Putin's pan-Slavic neo-imperialist ambitions to swallow an independent nation state. Similarly, post-colonial India 
chose not to join the United Kingdom and its allies following World War II, instead setting its own non-aligned course beholden to no superpower. How, how dare they? How dare they pursue self-determination rather than subordinate themselves to, to the West? Does this person even hear themselves? Today, however, the country is unsympathetic to Ukraine's determination to be free of imperialism and ally with the U European Union and NATO. Again, Ukraine from 2014 to today is a product of Western imperialism. And if India wanted to be sympathetic to its determination to be free of imperialism, that is precisely why India would not cooperate with the United States and the European Union and, and NATO. What else does this op-ed say? Finally, as the country that Prime Minister Modi proudly calls the mother of all democracy, India is somehow siding not with democratic Ukraine, but rather a despot who relies on sham elections and referendums, violence, and propaganda is the same power. I mean, that sounds like you're talking about Ukraine from 2014 onward. What else does this op-ed say? It says, India hasn't just dumped its principles in this conflict. It's also providing crucial financial support for Russia's brutal invasion and occupation of Ukraine. So this is, this is getting to the real point here, why they're upset. Not because uh, India isn't indulging in this fake democracy that the U.S. claims exists. This is the real reason the U.S. is upset with India. Despite U.S.-led efforts to isolate Russia's economy and hasten the war's end by destroying Russia's economy and collapsing Russia as a nation, India has chosen to increase imports of Russian oil tenfold while increasing that of fertilizer eightfold. Together with China, India purchases of Russian goods have largely negated the effects of transatlantic energy sanctions and India further funds Russia's war machine by purchasing big ticket items such as submarines, tanks, fighter aircraft, and surface to air missile systems. A full half of the country's arms imports come from Russia. Now you remember I was just talking about how the West is out of weapons and ammunition to send Ukraine and Russia is just getting started. They're, they're putting 300,000 additional men on the battlefield right now. That is what they're doing. The U.S. likely imagined that these sanctions were going to gut Russia's economy, cause it to collapse, and we wouldn't be here right now. Ru Russia would have collapsed and the war, like, like it says in the op-ed, it would have been over much sooner if only India and China and everyone else subordinated themselves to U.S. foreign policy objectives at the cost of their own uh, economic well-being, peace and stability, prosperity, and also the fact that once the U.S. gets rid of Russia, they're going to go after China and India as well. Now, the U.S. is no true friend of India. They're using India now. If India were ever to become a strong, independent, uh, global power, the U.S. would immediately begin undermining it as well. As a matter of fact, they, they already in many ways have been. And then we come to the most arrogant and condescending comment, I think, in my opinion, in this entire piece. Again, this is someone who works for the White House in Congress, uh, for the U.S. government. So is this still the country of Gandhi? Supporters who point to Modi's statement that today's era is not an era of war might say yes. And this is where they took some comments. India's prime minister said they tried to twist it out of context and, and make it mean something it obviously didn't mean. And this was their desperate attempt to portray India as on their side, as if India is, wasn't on their side. But if they could just twist the words and make it look like it was, somehow India would be on their side. It's, very, it's extreme. Like, like I said, this is absolute desperation uh, unfolding in front of us. But what that means in reality is wholly unclear to the residents of Bucha and Irpin. Again, pure war propaganda. Meanwhile, Modi's promise that India is on the side of peace and will remain firmly there is just as empty. How can one prop up this war's undisputed aggressor while claiming to be on the side of peace? Well, anyone who has been paying attention for the last 30 or 40 years, and I'm pretty sure India has been paying attention, they would have seen NATO blatantly lie to Russia, claiming that they were not going to continue expanding eastward and then proceeding to expand all the way up to Russia's border. Not only that, 
over the last 30 or 40 years, US-led NATO has destroyed one nation after the other. At least two of these nations, Libya and Syria, are Russian allies. It's, if you look at a map, it is clear as day what NATO was doing. They were destroying all of Russia's allies and they were encircling Russia itself. In 2014, they overthrew the elected government of Ukraine. However imperfect it was, it was, it was performing a balancing act between Russia and the West to the benefit as best it could for Ukraine. They overthrew that government and they put an anti-Russian government in its place. And then they began pumping weapons into Ukraine right on Russia's border. They just got done trying to destroy Syria, Russia's ally. They had already completely destroyed Libya. Now they're in Ukraine right on Russia's border. Where do you think they were going next? Who do you think was next to be destroyed? It is so obvious that it was the US and NATO encroaching on Russia and threatening Russia. It's obvious. And if you, you can't see it, you can't see anything. The United States cannot talk to nations, other nations like this anymore, especially a nation like India. It's got the second largest population on Earth. It is a rising economic power. It is a rising military power. They have their own space program. They can launch their own satellites into space. The United States cannot order them around and they cannot make them feel guilty for pursuing their own best interests rather than subordinating themselves to U.S. foreign policy objectives, especially in the middle of a tr what is transparently a U.S. proxy war against Russia, Russia being one of India's uh, closest allies and a very long-standing ally. This is how the op-ed concludes. This is how they end it. And more importantly, desirable as it may sound, in this conflict, peace is cheap and could be easily achieved. Ukraine must only concede defeat for peace. Instead, freedom is the goal, and for that, the price is high. As long as India, China, and others continue to play their current roles, that price will continue to rise for Ukraine, the U.S., and its European allies. There's no doubt that a new chapter of history is being written in Eastern Europe today. The Ukrainian nation, its leaders, and its allies will likely be cast as valiant and maybe even victorious. But whether India can recast itself as something other than Putin's enabler, remains an open question. You know how I think this chapter is going to be written? I think it's gonna be something like this. Uh, this is where Western imperialism grinds to a halt and it's going to be India to help deliver uh, one of the final blows, uh, laying it to rest. This is a story about how India escaped out from under Anglo-American imperialism and how when Anglo-American imperialism dies, India will be one of those standing over it. And I think this is something that desperately needs to happen for the sake of humanity. Uh, this was not going to have, ha if, if the U.S. did not overthrow the elected, the ele we're talking about democracy, the U.S. overthrew an elected government in Ukraine in 2014. If that had not happened, this conflict wouldn't be happening right now. If the U.S. was not openly determined to encircle contain, divide, and destroy Russia, subjugating Russia to U.S. interests. This would not have happened. This is not about Russian imperialism. Ukraine had been part of Russia. This is not about Russia crossing an ocean and creating an international crisis. This is about the United States crossing an entire ocean to create an international crisis. So it's very important to keep all of this in mind. It's also important to keep track of the increasingly deranged and desperate op-eds that I'm seeing. This is someone, again, Janus Lazda was a policy advisor in the White House and U.S. Senate. This is not just someone that walked off the street and got column space in Politico. This was someone who, at one point or another, had some, some sort of influence. So we, we've watched the United States go from one nation to the other around the globe, destroying them, either directly with its own military invasions and occupations, or doing so by proxy, or a little bit of both. We've watched them destroy these nations. Uh, who actually really thinks that Ukraine is the first country the US wants to genuinely help? Who honestly, realistically believes the United States is going to help rebuild Ukraine after it's done fighting America's proxy war against Russia for it? 
Who thinks the United States is going to help Ukraine rebuild when the United States itself is rotting out from under the American people because they don't, they're not rebuilding anything even back in the United States? Who's still falling for this? I really wonder. But there's a lot more we can talk about in terms of how this desperation is manifesting itself. But for now, let's leave it there. Uh, if you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps the channel grow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I'm on Telegram. I update that several times a day. All of my YouTube videos are automatically backed up on Rumble and Odyssey. It might take a day or two, but they eventually end up there. Subtitles on my YouTube videos also can take a day or two to show up. So please, if you're waiting for subtitles, be patient. In the video description below, you will find links to all of the, the stories and articles that I referenced in this video, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my videos on YouTube. If you would like to support my work, you can do that through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and also as a last resort, PayPal, because now PayPal is becoming very political and I don't know how much longer I'm gonna be on that platform. To everyone who has been helping, thank you so much. I could not do this work without that support, so thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.